In the military, you're given a uniform and instructed on how to do things and when to do them. But what happens when the cadence fades and you're no longer wearing that uniform? I'm Papa Kilo, and I started this podcast to fill that silence with direction and to provide overall support for my beloved military family. Welcome to the Morning Formation. Welcome to the Morning Formation. Our guest today is retired First Sergeant Samuel Phillips. He did a podcast with us just yesterday, explaining his time, the 20 years that he served after being drafted at the end of Vietnam at 1971. And the last episode he shared with us his experiences shortly after joining the military from being drafted. We stopped at the point of the beginning of his time as a drill sergeant. So hi, First Sergeant. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's continue down this journey of your career in the military. Um, we left off last talking about your transition, your acceptance into, uh, you had filed the paperwork and you got accepted into becoming a drill instructor. Okay. I'll start off by telling you that uh, the ranger school had a lot to do with a lot of the things that I did and the way that I did things because at the uh, completion of ranger school, you feel like you're superhuman. And a lot of people feel intimidated by the fact that you had completed ranger school. Some of them respected you, some of you, some of them felt intimidated. That went I right along on into my drill sergeant career also, uh, more so than before, because when I was in an airborne unit in Germany, there were several ranger qualified people there and we kind of hung out together after moving to Fort Knox and getting into the drill sergeant field, uh, being Fort Knox with an armor post, there were very very few and far between people walking around with ranger tab on their shoulder. So as I became a drill sergeant, I again was placed in a position where I was serving with a lot of drill sergeants. That that was another unique badge you get to put on your uniform. Uh, and here now I was serving with uh, a lot of drill sergeants that had the combat patch on and had been in the service for several years. I didn't have the combat patch. I did get my drill sergeant badge put on, and uh, I was a one of those shake and bake E5s, and these other other drill sergeants that I joined in the ranks with were most were combat veterans and been in the service a long time and had gone to the ranks to get their stripes that they were wearing. But anyway, when I got into uh, being a drill sergeant, I first was assigned to Charlie Company, 11th Battalion, and. Uh, met some real hardcore drill sergeants and I learned, you know, going through drill sergeant school, you learn a lot of things, but you don't really learn the particulars of being a drill sergeant and how, how to be a drill sergeant until you actually put your boots on the ground and you start watching other drill sergeants and you learn the techniques from them. I had a lot of good, good drill sergeants. I learned a lot of good things from. On the other hand, uh, you know, it's like in every job, you have some good and you have some bad. I probably picked up a lot of bad habits and tried to shake them later on. But anyway, uh, and during the, that time in the early 70s or mid 70s, it was the, the thought of war and Vietnam was still in fresh in everybody's mind. As a drill sergeant, we had the capabilities. If we had a, a, a trainee come in for basic training and for whatever reason, we did it in like he's the way he performed, it was very easy to evaluate him and put him on the street because now we're getting back into the thing that I uh, called supply and demand. Uh, we had a lot of trainees coming into the service, but there wasn't a big demand for them. So the Department of the Army made it very easy for us to have an evaluation system, write up some statements on them, and within three or four weeks, they'd be back home if we didn't like the way they performed. It was easy. So I think in a, in a way that was good because it gave you a chance to do the best that you could on evaluating a person. And it gave you a chance to have quality instead of quantity in the service. Just want to back it up a little bit. So when you were actually going through the, the drill sergeant school, the drill instructor school, was there any type of specific training during that time that is most notable? I mean, I've heard before from folks that have been through that school in order to learn how to, to instruct one of the things, one of the techniques that they would use was basically just they would instruct to a tree or some type of inanimate object. Was there any kind of techniques that you used during the, the drill instructor school that was very notable for you to remember? Oh, you mean to practice? Yeah, to practice on how to talk to trainees and how to instruct. 
Yeah, I, I'd like to get by myself and just talk to a mirror myself. That's what I like to do. And it was best once you got, a little, I guess, a little more confidence to get with another person that you're going to school with and you give each other classes. Because when you give a class, whether it be on rifle marksmanship or drill and ceremony, whatever class it was, if it was in a book, you had to actually memorize word for word every comma period in that book and you had to recite that particular class those instructions in that book verbatim for the mm -hmm. book and if you're doing if you're doing that to a tree the tree can't look at the book and tell you if you messed up or not so the best thing to do was to get with a buddy and that's what we tried to do i'd practice until i felt like i well i did that pretty good to myself in a mirror and then i would go get a buddy and I'd say you need to here's the book let me give you this class and see if i miss a word mm -hmm. so that's that's the way we did it. And they were, they, drill sergeant school was not a pushover class. I mean, it was just for an example, we had uh, a barracks that nobody stayed in, mm -hmm. but we had to go in early enough every morning that we could buff the floors. The floors were black tile. If you've ever tried to get the swirl marks out of a black car when you were waxing it, you know, it's not easy. We had to buff that floor and make it look like a mirror every morning, even though no one walked on it because no one lived in the barracks. We were allowed to live at home. So they, they treated you pretty rough and i remember mm. one time that uh, i got a real a real good chewing for uh, ass chewing for uh, i picked a class mm -hmm. you had to draw your classes like in in drilling ceremony they'd put all the drilling ceremony classes into a hat and you go over and, and you'd pull it out and that's one you had to give class on you didn't know you only had to give one class but you didn't know what it was going to be so you had to get ready for all of them and i pulled out the one that i didn't want mm -hmm. and i opened it up in front of the drill sergeant tack I opened that little piece of paper up and I looked at it and I said, oh man, you got to be kidding me. And he, boy, he lit into me. He said, no candidate, I'm not kidding you. And he just went on and on. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This is a very serious class. And if you don't want to get it, you can just pack your clothes and leave. I said, no, I want to give it. <laughs> but anyway, that they did, they treated you pretty rough. Mm -hmm. And how long was that training? Uh, I believe that was five weeks, if I believe correctly now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I wanted to ask you too, how long after you finished up with training, got certified, and then actually got in, got, you know, jumped into a basic, you know, taking over a basic training platoon, how long do you think it took you to actually feel comfortable? Maybe after one cycle, six weeks at that, at that time, basic training was six weeks long. Mm -hmm. So after, after you was able to, to watch and work through one six week cycle, then you're pretty much ready to go on your own. Now, was this the type of training where you could go home every night or did, did they require you to stay like within their own quarters for those six weeks? No, you could, you, you could go home. Okay. No one, that's what I said. No one lived in those barracks, but we had to maintain them as though we lived there. Now, what was the dropout rate like? It was fairly high. I don't remember what the uh, percentage ratio was, but it, it was probably, I, I guess it was probably close to 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. And then, so what were some memorable moments that you had like during your time? And let's talk about your first cycle was how many years? Your first, I, want, I don't want to call it cycle, your first uh, stint as a drill sergeant. First three years. Yeah, your first is for three years and then two years, right? Right, correct. So your first three years, was there anything that is that sticks out in your mind or anything that is a little more memorable than the rest of those first three years? Oh, well, there was a couple, couple of incidences that happened that was, I probably won't forget for a long time. One of them was, uh, the one thing you have to remember, you had to take these civilian kids that didn't know anything about the military and turn them, try to turn them into a good, hard, tough soldier. And one of the things in being a good, good soldier would be to, sometimes you have to, you don't ask questions, you just react and do what you're told without thinking about it. So the drill sergeants, one thing that they wanted to do first, they put the fear of God into the trainee. So when you said something, that was the law. No questions asked. That's what you had to do. So I remember one incident, incident that <laughs> took place, and it was just, just before mm -hmm. supper time in the mess hall or the evening meal in the mess hall. Trainee had done something. I don't remember what, but he he had done something that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I let him go ahead and eat. And after he got finished eating, I told him to get in the low crawl pit and crawl, which was a sawdust pit. 
and I said, crawl back and forth in that sawdust pit. So I said, when you get done eating, I want you to hit that sawdust pit and crawl until I tell you to get out. Well, he did exactly that. He's a good soldier. He did exactly what I told him to. I'd forgot that I'd told him that, and I went home. About 11 o'clock at night, my phone rang, and it was the, C it was the drill sergeant that was on duty, on CQ duty that night. He said, Sergeant Phillips, said, you've got a trainee out here in this sawdust pit crawling, and he won't get out. He said, I tried to tell him to get out and go back in the barracks and go to bed, but he won't do it because he said, Drill Sergeant Phillips told me to crawl until he told me to get out. And that's what I'm going to do. So he had to call that trainee and tell him to come to the phone. And he, that Drill Sergeant Phillips wanted to talk to him. And I, he came to the phone when he heard Sergeant Phillips told him to. And I had to tell him, it's okay if you get out of that gravel or out of that sawdust pit and go to bed now. <laughs> and he did. So he crawled for what, five hours, and I forgot about him. I felt bad about it later, but you know, that's. I guess I guess you kind of I guess you kind of kind of gained a different uh, level of respect for that type of um, discipline. Yeah, yeah, I did, and I tried to learn to choose my words a little different after that too. So, mm -hmm. and is it is in that same company? Uh, I don't remember how much after that, but another incident happened that uh, the trainees it was getting toward on up into the cycle, and they got a, a weekend pass to go to the PX or to the bowling alley. I had one soldier in my platoon that was kind of a bully. I'd heard people talk about it before in the barracks, kind of a bully. And he proclaimed to be a uh, golden glove boxer from New York City. And people in the, the other trainees were kind of scared of him. And they let him bully him around because he'd, he'd uh, give them orders. And he wasn't a squad leader or anything, but he'd tell telling them what to do. But anyway, that weekend they got uh, some privileges and they went to the bowling alley. And I guess this this bully uh, drank some beer and he came back to the barracks and uh, beat up a couple of people. And uh, that was on Saturday. He come back to the barracks and beat up a couple of people. And uh, then Sunday morning, I just happened to drive by the company in civilian clothes. And I thought, I'm going to stop in and see how everything went. So I stopped by and I talked to the drill sergeant on duty. And I said, well, how'd everything go last night? Any of my people get in trouble? He said, well, yes, yeah, private so-and-so got a little bit drunk and come back and beat up some people in the barracks. He said, I kept them quiet last night. But he said, there's some of them you know, pretty pissed because so-and-so beat them up last night. So I said, oh, let me go talk to him. I walked over to the barracks and called that private's name, which I don't even remember his last name. Now I called the private's name out. I said, come on, son, you're going to orderly room. We're going to talk. So we went to start it out to the orderly room. He's behind me. I'm in civilian clothes. And he started making some smart remark about he's not afraid of drill sergeants. Ain't nothing you can do to me. So we got over in the orderly room, closed the doors. And uh, I started asking him what happened. And he just kept getting belligerent. I think he was still drunk, what he acted like. But he started getting belligerent. So I got up in his face and I started being a drill sergeant. I started yelling at him nose to nose. And then he started yelling back. And when he yelled back, it caused, he did, I won't say he spit, but the spray from his voice got in my face. And when it did, I took both my hands to his shoulders and I pushed him away from me. And when I did that, he tried to swing at me. And there was a half wall there, partition. And I put my hands up on that wall and jumped up with both feet. And I kicked him right in the chest with both my feet. He hit the wall and went down on the floor. And while we was arguing, back up for a minute, while we were arguing, I turned around and told the CQ, I said, call the MPs to come and get him and put him in jail. And the CQ had already called the MPs. So when I put this trainee on the floor, I immediately straddled right across his chest and I was slapping him right across his face with my knuckles when the MPs walked in. I was in civilian clothes. The MPs thought that I was the one that was causing the trouble and they grabbed me up and handcuffed me and... Uh, CQ said, no, no, it's, you got it wrong. So they said, oh, okay. <laughs> so after a little bit of an explanation, they uh, released me, put handcuffs on him and took him to the hospital to see about these little bit of blood he had running out of his face. But uh, after that, that trainee never did come back. He came back to the company, but he never did join back into that platoon. They put him in another platoon while we were waiting for his discharge. And uh, the trainees from my platoon, mm -hmm. I remember they, they thought that, I was some kind of a Superman because I come in there and I took care of that problem. And I had defeated somebody that they had feared for the whole cycle. And uh, they appreciated it because I, I did that for them. Turned out that this other platoon that they sent that 
same trainee to another platoon to keep him away from me. He got over there again and started being a bully and sodomized one of his fellow trainees. And he immediately left. I mean, it wasn't just within a day he was discharged and sent back home. There was one other incident happened in that same company. And there wasn't a lot of things that really stood out because every cycle seemed a lot alike. But there was one that I would like to talk about. And that's, I had a trainee one time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in my platoon. He was in a different platoon, but I was on CQ duty one night and they were, I know his, his drill sergeants had talked to me about, about this trainee several times and uh, they was on the process of kicking him out or it's called a trainee discharge program. And they were in the, they were in the process of kicking this trainee out. He was a big, tall Mm -hmm. guy and he had a strange look on his face all the time. I was on CQ one night and this, uh, trainee was that they was kicking out came over and he was to be my cq runner that night and so he sat there and he started he talked real friendly real nice to me he but he was real upset that other drill sergeants because they was kicking him out of the service and and i talked to him i tried to explain things to him and he said man i wish i'd have been in your platoon because i think we would have made it Mm -hmm. but anyway he was he was good and he and he started telling me things he said you know, I was, I was sent in the service for a particular reason. He was a, a sadist, didn't believe in God. He believed in the devil and they believed that the devil ruled everything. And he told me the reason he thought that way is that when he was a kid, he had a real bad home life and uh, he would pray to Jesus that things would get better and they never did. And then he said, he finally, he started praying to the devil and the devil made everything better for him. So they had sent, the devil had sent him into the military. He was, must have been a nutcase. The devil had sent him into the military so he could corrupt people and try to get more people to believe like him. He explained his, his way of life and, and his, his beliefs to me. And I, mm-hmm. I was intrigued. I mean, I sat there and I listened like it was a good movie, you know, watched his face. And when he was talking, I could see his eyes and his his eyebrows were almost pulled up, like some of the pictures of the devil that you that you have seen in in movies and in pictures. So anyway, that night finally ended, and it went on. And a few days later, a couple of days later, he uh, had fin- they had finished all the paperwork on him. It was time for him to leave, and uh, I happened to run into him by the mess hall there one day, and he said, Sergeant Phillips, he said, I appreciate me and you being able to talk the other night. And he said, I'm leaving. But he said, you haven't heard the last of me. He said, I, you know, he said, I could have done a lot more damage here if I'd have wanted to while I was here, but I, I didn't because of you. And I said, what could you have done? He said, I could have set one of these barracks on fire while everybody's asleep one night and I was on fire guard and these old wooden buildings would have burned up. And he said, I could have done some damage. I could probably kill some people. And I said, yeah, you could. I'm glad you didn't. Anyways, he left. The day after he left, we had an empty barracks. We had an extra barracks that didn't have people in it. The day after he left, that empty barracks burned to the ground. And I've always related the burning building to the story that he told me and the talk that we had. And that was, I thought that was a very unique soldier or trainee. He wasn't a soldier, very unique person, very unique experience. Yeah. You know, it just goes to show you that when you step outside your comfort zone and you go into the military and you go to training such as like basic or boot camp, you're literally thrown into barracks with people from all across the United States, people from different cultures, people from different backgrounds, different upbringings. You have all walks of life. I mean, everything from the Golden Gloves boxer from New York to the Satanist that is from wherever and has his own ideologies on things. But that is that's pretty wild. It's a pretty wild story right there. And was there any other stories that, that you can remember specifically from that first three years? Uh, no, they were pretty much all, all the same. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of small things I'm sure that happened and but pretty much every cycle was like the others, but you, you hit the nail on the head when you was talking about that. The one thing that the drill sergeants always had to keep in mind is that you graduate one group and a few weeks later you start another group, but they were all just a little bit different because you have to keep in mind that Every group you get in is you've got different people. They were raised different ways. They come from different parts of the countries and they have different beliefs. 
I mean, you, you, you'd have trainees that were from practically every state and every walk of life, every cycle. Mm -hmm. And you kind of had to keep that in mind because mm -hmm. every individual was different and there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. But, uh, like I, like I said, it's at the beginning, uh, about supply and demand and as the demand uh, dwindled uh, so did the supply because the army was just getting more particular they didn't accept as many volunteers as they did and even after the first year about a year and a half the numbers had gotten low enough to where the 11th battalion that I was in started in completely shut down and closed up we all had to reconsolidate in another company on down the street farther. And that's where I spent the other year and a half of that first three years, Delta 18-4. And by the way, Delta or Delta 18-5, the same company that about six years earlier that I had taken basic training in. So I ended up six, six and a half years later mm -hmm. being a drill sergeant in the same company that I was in when I was a trainee. And this was between what, what years now? Started in 1975 and went until 1978. Okay. And then from 1978, uh, where did you go after that? In 1978, when I got off drill sergeant status, you could, you're only allowed to stay three years at a time. And uh, after I did my two years, then I volunteered for the third year and was, was accepted for the third year after I finished that third year. I just had to wait for orders to see where I was going, and orders I got was go to the 20, 25th Infantry Division in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Okay. Now, was there anything in that second part, uh, the second your second tenure as a drill sergeant, that, that stands out for you? Not incidences, as I spoke of before, but I was ended up, I was a drill sergeant as an E5, as an E6, mm -hmm. and as an E7. By the time I made it, the first three years, I was E5 and E6. Mm -hmm. I went to Hawaii and I got promoted to E7. And I came back for my last two years mm -hmm. on drill status as an E7. I was more mature, more experienced. And uh, mm -hmm. it was it was different because now I was more of a senior NCO and I wasn't as, oh, I don't know the right word, wasn't as reckless, I guess, as I was the first three years. Uh, more of a professional, I think, guess. And I had some good friends. I just, there was a lieutenant in my company, uh, Lieutenant O'Connor. He didn't make a career out of the service, but after he finished his assignment and got out of the service, he went back to mm -hmm. New York, where he was from, and became a police officer. And he retired from the, from the police department in New York City, and he lives in northern New Jersey now. And just last week, he called me on the phone and to wish me a happy new year. He said, I try to call all my friends that I knew when I was in the military that had some kind of an influence on me as a young Lieutenant in the army. He said, you're one of them. So he called me. That made me feel pretty good. I can totally relate to what you're saying. I, matter of fact, I just contacted a soldier that worked for me when I was at a battalion S3. She said, Hey, hope you're having a new year, having a happy new year. And I just wanted to say, thank you. So you transitioned to the 25th infantry division. Now you're no longer a drill, drill instructor, a drill sergeant. I think that we should go ahead and we've been talking for about 30 minutes now. This is a, probably a good stopping point. We can start up again to finish off your career, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And I want to tell everyone right now, um, in case you haven't figured it out, First Sergeant Samuel Phillips is actually my father. Very proud to say that. He's been an inspiration for me in my military career as well. Um, I know that when I was going through basic training right out of high school, there was many times when uh, I was in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in the middle of the summer, there was a drill sergeant there and his name was Drill Sergeant Hall. He resembled my dad. And I remember many times when I was in the, uh, in the mulch pit getting smoked and looking up on that drill instructor podium and, and I would see him. Whenever I would get homesick or miss home, I would feel like, you know, I got I to gotta keep going. I got to keep pushing. I got to keep, you know, I got to keep making it through. And some of the things that you told me growing up, you know, the simple things like when they go and get tough, the tough get going. Those are the things that resonated in my mind to get me through some of my tough times because the military in general makes you step out of your comfort zone. You know, at 18, 19 years old, you're no longer under the protection of your parents. You're on your own. You're getting your, your paycheck. You know, you're, you're under the care of other people and you have to take care of yourself. And so I appreciate you, whether you knew you were there or not, you were there 
uh, when, when I went through some of my tough times, even when I was deployed or whatever, there was times where I would look up at the sky and I would, I would wonder if we were looking at the same stars. Thank you so much for, uh, for being an inspiration and, and doing this podcast with me because capturing these stories, I've heard about these stories, some of these stories over the years. You know, I, I think that uh, they deserve to be captured and encased and, and saved and shared with other people. It's, it's quite fascinating that you had 20 year career and all the things that you did, you know, you truly lived a, you truly lived a life. Thank you for giving me this time and we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up right now. Um, is there anything else that you want to finish off with before we finish off this podcast? No, just, I can totally relate to looking up at the sky and those stars because when I finished basic training and found out I was going to Fort Lewis, Washington, I thought, man, I'm in Kentucky and Fort Lewis, Washington is way, way, way over there. I'd never been that far away from home before. Never been away from home much. And getting out of Fort Lewis, Washington and uh, looking up at the stars and wondering if people back home, anybody was looking at the same star I was. I'd been so lonely. First, first few months when you're in the military is a very, very lonely time because you've got to get those thoughts of home out of your mind. Very, very lonely. And uh, some, some of the songs that I remember is when they come on the radio, like I'm leaving on a jet plane, I say, yep, that's me. Hmm. Yeah. You know what? I honestly believe that no matter how far you get into the military, you know, you could go to special ops training, go to ranger training, go to wherever training, you know, after your initial training, I always feel like that very beginning basic training boot camp that you go through is probably the toughest step to take because you're young. It's your first time on your own, you're cutting your own teeth. Once you get that under your belt and then you go to all the other stuff, I mean, I, I really, I think everybody remembers their drill sergeant. You know, I've had instructors for air assault course and things like I don't, I don't remember them, but I don't remember their names necessarily. Uh, but I do remember my drill sergeant, you know, drill sergeant Carter and drill sergeant Hall. Those are my drill sergeants for, and I'll never ever forget till the day that I die because those guys were a big part of my life for about nine weeks. Out on the range, going into an outside bathroom and written on the wall was some soldier had written his name and put the town he was from and it was a town that was just a few miles from my hometown and I could even kind of bond with that board on the wall I kind of wanted to tear that board off and take it with me because that was that was something from back home yeah and you know it's it's a small army I mean in in reality think about not to digress too much but when I was in Iraq I went to a, a special forces compound to drop off some some uh, material and supplies. And uh, there was a few NCOs standing out there. It was the middle of the night. And I recognized one of the uh, one of the NCOs. And at this time, I was a second lieutenant. And this was out in Talifar, out in near the close to the Syrian border. And I, I recognized this NCO because he was one of the drill sergeants that had worked in my, in my company. I, I told him who I was. He didn't know who I was, of course. But the names that I all mentioned and who my drill sergeants were. And the guy was so like, he was he was so excited to see me and he's like, well, I'm so proud of you. You know, you were just a private and now you're, now here you are as a second Lieutenant or whatever. And at any rate, it is a very small army. And even when I was in, you know, we can go into this later on, but I ran into a lot of your colleagues that you had early on. Uh, we'll continue this journey uh, next week, finish up and uh, talk about your time after drill instructor school, drill sergeant school and finish up your career and how things went and when you retired. So Thank you for your time today. I appreciate you giving me the, the time and the uh, we'll, uh, for all the listeners out there, we'll finish this up again. Okay, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. We're out. You've been listening to the Morning Formation Podcast. We hope you found today's material helpful and of value to your current situation. Whether today's show took you back to a nostalgic time or helped you think about tomorrow, thank you for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you again. Make sure to find us on Instagram at the underscore morning underscore formation underscore podcast on YouTube at the morning formation podcast and send us an email at the formation podcaster at gmail.com. Stay safe and stay motivated. Warriors fall out.